Did you bring a Bible with you tonight? If you did, go ahead and pull it out, please. We're going to certainly use it tonight. And, and it's my great honor and my great privilege to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Um, we really, we do our best to guard this platform. We don't just let anybody get up here and speak. And tonight, it's my great privilege to introduce Pastor Dave Patterson. And uh, Pastor Dave has been in ministry for a long time. He and his wife started their church 21 years ago uh, in Vacaville. Can anything good come from Vacaville? For those of you that don't know where that is, it's up north. It's by uh, Napa, up by San Francisco area. And uh, I got the opportunity earlier this year to meet Pastor Dave for the first time. I've known, uh, we've had a lot of mutual friends. I know his son-in-law very well. Um, but getting to spend some time with Pastor Dave and Donna earlier this year, um, there's just certain people that when you get around them, one, they, they, they make you fall in love with Jesus more, but then two, um, they really stretch your capacity to think, um, your, your capacity for vision for the future. And every time I get around these guys, that, that thing on the inside of me, that God thing inside of me just starts moving and starts shaking, and I get excited for what could be. And these guys, they really stretch me, and uh, I'm excited for them to be able to share their word tonight. Uh, pastor of the Father's house, come on, can we get on our feet and just say welcome to Pastor Dave Patterson. Well, thank you all. It's good to be with you. Pull up a chair. Hey, uh, just such an honor to be here at Cottonwood Church, man. I don't know if you guys know how blessed you are. I think you have an idea. This is an incredible church. And just a little background on myself, and then we'll go to the Word. By the way, I'm, I'm just excited to go to the Word because it's all about Jesus, isn't it? He's the living word. He's the centerpiece of your Bible. And as we magnify the scripture tonight, Jesus is going to be revealed and, and do what he does. And he's going to speak. You know, don't forget the word of God is alive and it's powerful. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to come and speak through the scriptures, he has an ability in a room this big with all the different faces and ages to customize the word straight to your heart. To find you right where you are and speak directly to you. I'm excited about that. How about you? And it's okay uh, if you talk back to the preacher at our church. You know, quiet church is a dead church. So if you got a uh-huh, that's right. If I say anything remotely inspiring, just wave a hanky and shout me down. All right. Those are the rules. So I got a little history in Southern Cal. I was born just up the street here in Long Beach. And then my beautiful wife, I'll introduce in a minute, was born down in Oceanside. And then when I came to Christ, the Lord snatched me out of a life of addiction, and I was a train wreck, and Jesus redeemed me, and uh, I was a bit of a musician, so we started traveling, doing some music, and this was back in the day of the rise of contemporary Christian music. Does anybody remember that? Because it started right, you're, you're in the epicenter of it. And so we actually became youth pastors uh, in Fountain Valley Border, Fountain Valley, Huntington Beach, many years ago. So I got some history here in Southern Cal, I have family and uh, Fountain Valley, Santa Ana, all about. So when we come down, we've been doing this for years. Every time I come down to Southern Cal on vacation or to see family, we sneak in here on a Sunday. I usually sit right, right back here, right where the guy in the checkered shirt, right there. That's my chair. You're in my seat, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's where I sit. And I, I've, been, I've been stalking Pastor Bayless for years. I love his preaching, his teaching, his passion. He's just a grace on his life. So we've been coming to Cottonwood for quite a while, just receiving and like I say, stalking you on every form of social media. Um, little known secret, though, God's been working in our church. We're in multiple locations. It's all been a work of grace for sure. But we got ready to build our main campus in Vacaville. Couldn't anything good come out of Vacaville or Nazareth? I get it, right? So we, we came down to Southern Cal, and we're touring all these amazing churches, Mariners and different ones. And so they said, you got to go see Cottonwood. You guys were maybe like three years old here. And just figuring out how to run the lights, you know? So we, we came, you're probably still doing that. <laughs> so we came in, I just fell in love with this place. And I think there's something holy about a sanctuary. I think God inhabits spaces and places that are dedicated for him. Um, but we actually enjoyed it so much. And a little known secret, we looked at your risers up there where you guys are sitting. Hey, hey, way up on the top, how you guys doing? We call those the expensive seats, not the cheap seats at our church. They cost more to build. But... Um, True story. 
So our rise and width of our, of our new auditorium is exact. We measured it at Cottonwood. I walked around 15 different auditoriums all over Southern Cal. So I said, I'm going to take a little bit of this home. My, my goal was when, when we grow up, we're going to be like Cottonwood. So we're on our way. So it's just good to be here. Good to be in the house. Hey, I want to honor your, your amazing pastors, Bayless and Janet. They are, they are truly, uh, amen. Let's, let's give them, come on, tell them about it. <laughs> I don't know them that well, but everything I've known from afar, I, I just nothing but respect. And I know that what they have led you into to build this house and this campus and this auditorium. Uh, my my mother-in-law, Donna's mom, who uh, she came here for many years and was a prayer warrior and went to be with Jesus a few years back after a battle with cancer. But we would just track your growth from the old building to here and everything that God has done. And I know you don't get to a place like this with the influence you have now that reaches far uh, deeper and wider than you can imagine. It doesn't happen without great leaders that are visionary. So we're just, I'm honored to be on this stage. It's, I don't take this lightly. And to get to know your pastors and Harrison, we love these guys. Can we just give it up for your pastors one more time? Tell them we love them. All right. So, uh, hey, this is a picture of my beautiful family here. I think we got some, some media. Uh, yeah, there they are. That's my oldest daughter on the right, Tasha, her uh, husband, Joseph. They're our worship pastors, oversee conferences and bits. And then Jude and Sierra, student ministry. And that is Cohen Iver and Jack Lewis Boone right there, the little man right there. And then this, this picture here is a few months old. My daughter, my youngest daughter, Sierra, she's about, what, eight months pregnant, babe? So we're getting ready to have our first granddaughter. Come on, somebody. We got three boys. We need some pink ribbons in the building. Well, I, I tell you why I'm excited. So, so I've been praying for your church, knowing I'm going to visit, and uh, just a sense of what God is doing and he's going to do. And I don't really know why, where you guys stand on the, you know, the prophetic and all that, but just a sense of what I believe, and you can judge and weigh this, what God's going to do in the future. So, and that's why I'm excited to share this word. I truly believe this. This is not hype, but I believe your best and most influential days are just up ahead. And the momentum that you started with, and I don't know much of your history other than it's been a great one, but the momentum when people were coming in by the hundreds and then the thousands, and this thing didn't happen without a legitimate move of God happening in, over the decades, amen? But I, I really sense and believe that there is another wave coming there, there's something of the Holy Spirit outpouring in Southern California, and you're going to be in the dead center of it. So don't, don't get comfortable. Don't get complacent because God's going to move you into other areas. There's some great things coming up ahead. I know this about Jesus. He always saves the best wine for last, doesn't he? I know this about the move of the Holy Spirit, that the greatest move of God and the sweeping of souls into the harvest for the second coming of Christ has already been launched into the earth, and it's picking up momentum. So things are not backing up. Things are not slowing down. Jesus is not coming for a yawning, complacent, half burnt out, dried up church. He's coming back for a glorious, thriving church that's impacting the world for his name. And I'm just telling you guys are a part of that. So buckle up in Jesus' name, all right? You ready for the word tonight? Shall we go there? Uh, I'm gonna, it, these are going to be on the screen. I hope you take notes, and if you carry moleskins or journals or exercise your thumbs on your device, just don't be serving Instagram because the Lord knows, and he will judge you accordingly. No, I'm just, that, that's offsides. I'm not at home. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, shall we? Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose, I'm reading from the Amplified, to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think. Time out, time out, I'll keep reading. You ever read a verse in the Bible and go, really? Is this the offer? Is this that hyperbole stuff I've heard about? Is this a parable? What? Is this really the stuff? And yes, it is. He's saying he's able to do far super abundantly more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams. That's big stuff right there. It's the abundantly, exceedingly above stuff. But here's the caveat, and here's where you need to lean in. It is according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen? Amen. So the great things that God wants to do in your life, in your family, in your business, in your marriage, in your church, in your community, are exceedingly abundantly above anything we can dream up or even pray about 
But the caveat is, it's according to the work of the Holy Spirit, the dynamic expansion of the very life and image of God happening in you. So God's not going to do it outside of you. He's going to do it through you. And people paint themselves in a corner where they, God, I need a miracle, or I need this amount of money, or bring me this spouse, or, you know, I, I see a ministry. Well, yeah, he wants to give you some great and precious gifts. They come down from the Father of lights, but he does it as the power of the Holy Spirit expands you internally. So how many guys up for just a, a little bit of a growth process tonight in your inner man and say, God, I'm ready for the super abundantly in Jesus' name. So here's the question. How much faith does it take to live in the exceedingly abundantly? I mean, I read this verse, and I think, wow, that's like high octane. That's like a G5 spiritual network, plutonium, whatever. This is just way above my pay grade. But I want to tell you something. I want to stick with you. You know how much faith it takes to move into the exceeding abundant in your life? You know how much faith it takes to move into things that you only imagined, you haven't even dreamed of yet? A mustard seed is a good answer over here from the seeds. But I'll tell you what it is. It's just enough faith to move with God. Just enough faith to take the next step. Just enough faith to be obedient in your sphere of life and influence. That's all God is looking for. And if we'll be obedient enough and humble and hungry enough to take the next step, there is no limit to what God will do in our life. Amen? Amen. Let me pray just a bit. Father, I thank you for this great church. In the next few precious minutes, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this house. You're here right now. Speak to every life. I pray for those that are in a, they're kind of stuck. They're in a place in their life, business, relationships, even their walk with you where they've plateaued. I pray tonight you would free them, get them unstuck and moving forward in faith. And we pray it in the great name of Jesus and all God's people said? Oh, that's right. Well, let me ask you a personal question. Uh, Anybody out here uh, like to camp? Do we have any campers? And I'm talking about get out your tent and your boots and go chop some wood, build a fire, catch a fish, set up the tent, work really hard. Wave at me, all you campers. Okay, I hate you, man. No. Because I'm going to give you a tip about some good camping sites. You ready? Here's some good camping sites. And this is worth the price of admission, whatever that is. A couple of my favorites. The Grand Wyatt Hut in Maui. Wailea, great camping site. Ritz-Carlton, Half Moon Bay, great camping site. The Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs, Colorado. See, that's how, that's how I roll on the camping site. Are you with me? Let me tell you a story, quick. Um, so my, my brother-in-law up in Oregon lives in Roseburg. He's an outdoorsman. He does whitewater rafting trips for Native Americans. He's been doing it for years. And so he's got all the gear. He says, Dave, we're going to go up the North Umquam. We're going to camp. We go up there. But we work so hard just to get the, the rig packed, right? And you work and you get up there and you, you set up the tent and you chop the wood and you do, you do all the stuff. And I'm exhausted. I'm like, when does the fun start? I, I guess that was the fun. Then you go down and you catch, you know, and I'm not like your pastor at all. I don't have that fishing gift. I catch some little lame eight-inch trout that should be thrown back. And so, so you're eating this poor little trout and you're sitting around. And th- there's a brief moment where the fire's burning and you got your s'mores out there. And man, you're camping. You're like, I'm doing, I'm a wildlife guy right now, you know. But then, true story, go in the tent. And uh, about three in the morning, all the air runs out of the air mattress. And my beloved wife and I, Donna, we are sleeping on the ground. And then here's a tip from Uncle Dave. Never take your leftover s'mores into the tent at night because the ants would love to come join you and finish those off, okay? So on and on it goes. All that to say, here's my thesis tonight. Camping is great, tents are great, but tents are a temporary location on on the way to a permanent destination. God never meant you to stay in a spiritual tent on the way to what he's taken you to. So I want to take a couple minutes tonight and talk about moving with God and camping trips. And we'll look to the nation of Israel, the children of God, as they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, and then they started this camp out. And God said, hey, I want you to dwell in tents in the middle of all the camps, by the way, you're going to divide up into tribes. So there's Naphtali and Zebulun and all the guys. And you're to camp in a certain section. And then in the middle of all the little baby tents, there will be one tent, okay? And the key to this whole camp out is that God was camping in the middle of them. So I have a couple of pictures just to refresh your memory. This is review for many of you. But uh, 2 million Jews, if you could bring this up on the screen. 
Two million Jewish people, 600,000 named warriors. And the, the key, the dynamic was, God said, I'm gonna go with you on this camp out. And by day, there'll be a, a pillar of cloud. And by night, the cloud will turn into fire. A very, I believe, accurate artist rendition of the camp out in the Sinai wilderness with two million people camped out. And so as they took off, God said, but here's the key. You're not to stay in one place forever. Don't get comfortable, don't get stuck, because when the cloud moves, it's time for you to pick up your temporary dwelling and move with God. And that's what I came to tell you tonight and to tell somebody in this room, that it's time to get unstuck, roll up your temporary dwelling, and say, Holy Spirit, where are you leading me next, amen? Here's the instruction in Numbers chapter nine, if you wanna highlight, underline, go there. This is the key verse. Whether the clouds stayed above the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the people of Israel stayed in camp and did not move. But day or night, when the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and they moved on. Can we say it real loud, they moved on. They moved on. So, and you can read this, it's redundant. It's like he gives this instruction like 12 times. It's like, hey, here's the deal. Camp out, enjoy it, enjoy the manna, the water, watch the fire. And how comforting would that be, by the way, if the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the termites and all the ites are out there trying to take you out? And, you know, the wife, uh, whatever her name is, you know, Rebecca, she's scared and she taps on her husband, Levi, uh, the Amalekites are coming. You open up your tent and there's that pillow of fire. And he goes back and he goes, I got you, dear. We're going to be all right. It's a pretty good setup. But here was the thing. When the, when the pillar of fire moved, you had to move. Or you were out from underneath the protection. You were out from underneath the guidance and the enemies could sweep in. And this is a type of the church. The reason we have such detailed information about this extensive camping trip is because it's speaking to your life and to my life. And we need to move with God. They are called the congregation in the wilderness or the community in the wilderness. Now, I know something about you and I know something about me, and here's what it is. The toughest place in your Christian journey, listen, is the gap between the promise and the fulfillment, the vision and the fruition, the prophetic word and the accomplishment. There's always a waiting period, and the tendency of broken and fallen humanity is to get stuck, to hit a ceiling, and there's a lot of things that drive stakes down deep, right? You go to leave the campground and the stakes have been driven down so deep, you're just like, I guess we'll just camp here for a decade. Unforgiveness will get you stuck. Bitterness will get you stuck. Self-serving will get you stuck. Or a prolonged trial without break. There's a lot of things that get us stuck. But God says, hey, I'm calling you to move on because you haven't seen the fulfillment of it yet. And if the Holy Spirit would use me tonight in just the smallest way, I would ask him to do this. In something that said or breathed or prayed, that you would get a glimpse that there is a universal plan. That God is building his church in every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and you are a vital part of it. And the good work that he began at Cottonwood Church some three decades ago or so, he will complete it. But he needs all of us. You're the community. In fact, you're here on a Wednesday night. I would say you're probably the core. And God is, is calling us to move with him. So let me give you three ways to move with God. I think these will help you, and then we'll pray, and then we'll all go out to eat. Let's all go to the restaurant together, shall we? You pick a spot, we'll freak them out. Get the buses. Party of 1600, please. <laughs> three things, here you go. First one, you gotta move with the cloud and the community. Move with the cloud and the community. As I said, the picture we just saw, they were called the congregation in the wilderness. And I want you to get this tonight, that you've been connected to something far bigger than yourself. It's called the bride. It's called the local church. I hope you know this, that the church is not your pastor's idea. It's not a denominational idea. Jesus said, here's what I'm gonna build. He took first person ownership of his church. And the church is just not a couple would-be theologians having a cup of coffee, rubbing their beers, talking Calvinism versus Arminianism. That's not the church. It's not a couple guys just auditing a service around Southern Cal at their leisure and picking up sermons online. Okay, I'm, I'm offending somebody, but that's cool. It's an equal offense opportunity. <laughs> I'll tell you what the church is. 
The church means this. Those who have been called out and called together, they are under fivefold spiritual covering, being led by a man and woman of God. There's a, there's a pattern, there's a model in the Bible. So when God calls you out of darkness, he calls you together with other believers. And when you are part of the church, that means he, he loved you enough to set pastors and apostles, prophets, teachers, and evangelists in the middle of you to guide and to shepherd. That is the church that Jesus is building. And his grace is on the church. The fire is on the church. The cloud is on the church. The reason I want you to get this is there's a blessing on Cottonwood that when you say, this is my house, something happens. That blessing becomes your blessing. The vision on this house becomes your vision. Now there's a reason for your business to prosper beyond taking care of you. Now there's a reason for your gifting to develop because you've become a part of something that is far bigger than yourself. And there's been a sly and consistent plan of the enemy to get people to push back and say, well, I don't need the church. You know, I, I love Jesus, but I don't like all those people. And, you know, I'm part of the church universal, whatever that means. No, God's design are local houses of worship with called men and women of God. And you come under a covering that has authority and fire on it. And this house is one of those places. Let me just talk to you as a father and Lord for a minute. If you're not planted in a life-giving church, get planted. And, and maybe this is your home church. It probably is. But if not, pray. Ask the Lord where to lead you. It says in the book of Acts that God added daily. God adds people to their number, to the church. And when you get planted and say, I'm in the house, something happens. Your roots go down deep, and you're like that tree planted by a river of water, and you bear fruit in every season. You become an oak of righteousness. But you got to get planted in the house. Anybody hearing that? Now, says, in, what is it, Hebrews 10, 25, it says, so listen, listen, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, right, as the manner of some is, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day of Christ approaching. Guys, listen, if there's ever a time we need a community and connection and spiritual covering and spiritual fathers in the Lord, it's right now in this season of history, so get planted in the house, and I think you just have a, need to have a little attitude with it. Because a lot of people will bash your church. Oh, you go to that big church. Is that one of those mega churches? You know, and they got all kinds of negatives. You've probably heard it. But I think something needs to rise up in your spirit that says, yeah, that's my house. That, that, can we say that together? That's, yeah, and with some attitude. Like, that's my house. Don't be talking about my house. I love those people. I invest there. That's family. So move with the fire, because here's what will happen. Back to our camping trip in the wilderness says right here in Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came up out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out? They met you on your journey and attacked who? All who were lagging behind. Those are the ones that get picked off. Do not live your life in isolation. I don't know what you do here with small groups, connect groups, whatever those look like. But get in community because the enemy comes to pick off those who are lagging behind. So the way that you're going to move with God, you're going to get planted in the house and you're going to move with the community in Jesus name. You got it? Number two, keep moving toward your full potential. Keep moving toward everyone in this room has a capacity that is untapped. I'll explain that. When you're in the middle of a journey, especially when you're in a wilderness, you have a tendency to find a place where it looks like this is all there is. So back to my story, got saved from a life of addiction and brokenness and drunkenness and uh, drugs and all that mess. And so started traveling, doing some music and singing. And we ended up with a little band and we're down in Phoenix, Arizona in the summer. Our tour manager booked us in Idaho in the winter and Phoenix in the summer. So fired him. Yeah. So we're down there and... Uh, I'm a young believer, man. I'm just like, I'm ready to save the world. I play a little harmonica, guitar. I'm ready to go for it. We get down there, and the band breaks up. Anybody ever watch VH1? The band always <laughs> breaks up. So the band breaks up. We got no money, no time, no run out of altitude and airspeed. And Don and I, I had a house, sold it, had a bunch of stuff, sold it, bought all this music gear. We're living in a 26-foot trailer, a 26-foot travel ease trailer in Phoenix and a hundred and 2,000 degrees, <laughs> and I'm not hearing from God. 
I, I mean, God, I, I gave my life for this. I gave everything I had. I'm following you, Jesus. Now I'm dying in the desert in this 26-foot travel east trailer. Ah! You know, that whole conversation you have with God when your hopes and dreams are not fulfilled. And I remember clearly, I went through a little bit of a depression. Uh, it was a downtime on the graph of my Christian journey. And I thought, here's where it ends. I die in Phoenix in a 26-foot trailer. This is it. This is the pinnacle of my ministry. And the enemy will tell you, you went through a divorce, oh, that's it. You'll never be in covenant relationship again. Oh, you bankrupted that business? That's where you end, bro. You will never get back on your feet. Or you tried ministry, it didn't work, or whatever your story is, uh, it's a very real ploy of the enemy to say, this is the wilderness you die in. This is the small little region. This is all you got. But listen, you serve a God. You have a heavenly father that made you this promise. If you are willing and available, he will do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think according to the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within you. That is your promise. You got more capacity than you know. I'll give you a verse here out of 2 Corinthians. It says, we, however, will not boast beyond measure. Okay, we're not gonna get all blown up about our accomplishments. Here's what Paul said. But within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. Now for you note takers, just I'm gonna teach you one Greek word if you don't already know it. Three words in 2 Corinthians 10, 13 that are the same Greek word. Measure, limits, and sphere are all the same word. And here's what it is if you bring it up. It's metron, Greek, metron. It's a measured boundary. It's a potential inheritance. It's a capacity that God sets. Now, now lean in. When God designed you in your mother's womb and all your days were written in a book before you ever lived the first one, your name is written on his hand, he gave you a metron. He knew your capacity, your ability to influence. And our job is to step through life, finding out and discovering the full potential inheritance that God has for us. And this is not a limiting word. This is not like God says, okay, for you, yeah, here, here's 10 square feet, do your best. And here's the lid free. No, that's not our God. He doesn't say, here's a 26 foot trailer, work it out. I am convicted and convinced that very few people live up to their complete potential. Was it Dwight L. Moody, the great revivalist, who said, it's yet to be seen what God will do through one life that is fully yielded to him. So what is your capacity? And I don't say this to put you down and go, hey, get busy, man, do something with your life. You're getting older, bro. No. I say it to encourage you that there's more to do for him. There's more to step out in faith and accomplish than we've ever seen. And we have to be determined that we're not gonna get stuck in the middle of the desert, all right? So get this in your heart tonight. What is it that's untapped in your life? Let's just take a moment and let the Holy Spirit breathe that over you. What is it that you've yet to accomplish? You know, I'm, uh, I was gonna tell you my age, but I retracted that. Donna, would you stand up? Can you stand up, babe? This is my beloved wife. I forgot to. We've been married 36 years. Fourth grandkid on the way. I forgot the point I was trying to make. But it was really awesome. No, it, it's there's there's more. And so for years, man, planning church and working with staff and hitting the wall and all the spiritual struggles. And at some point, you think, okay, you get in your 50s and maybe we we tap out here. And God, God spoke to me. I believe in the, the voice of the Lord. I believe God speaks to his sheep. I believe we are a sheep when we hear his voice. I believe all the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14 are for today. So I'm going through kind of this deal in my mid-50s a little while back, and the Lord says, Dave, he says, your fourth quarter will be the strongest. Get ready for what I'm about to do. Let me just speak to a couple of you guys in the room that are in your 50s and 60s and beyond. Don't ever tell God that, well, okay, I, my best years are behind me. Don't tell that to Moses and Caleb and Sarah and Abraham. Come on, the list is long. So you have to have this mindset that, God, I'm on your schedule, and I'm going to accomplish everything that you've put in front of me. I want to do all that you've called me to do in my lifetime. Is anybody with me on that? So don't stop in the middle of it. And here's the last one, and we'll, we'll wind down here in a few. Number three, you have to refuse to stay behind. You have to refuse to stay behind. Now, 
if we go back to our, our happy campers and mostly unhappy campers, how many you know that the majority, the vast majority died in the wilderness? They died in the wilderness because they complained, they struck out against leadership, and they really complained against God. But as they did that, there was a couple of them that made a decision that I will not stop right here. And how many know the story of Caleb? So they're getting ready to go into the promised land, the inheritance. And the only ones who get to go in are the college agers and below, actually the student ministry, I think it was 20 years and below, because they didn't complain against God. But all the grown warriors and all the old folks who complain in the wilderness, they're gonna die out in the wilderness. They don't go into the promised inheritance of God. So the young folks get to go in, they get a hall pass. The Levites get to go in. Who are they? They're the worshipers, just a tip. Those who worship and those who serve, they went into the land. So they're getting ready to go in and this old guy Caleb stands up. He says, hey, 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 I want my mountain. He says, I'm 80, but I'm as strong as and able right now. I, I'm, I'm just like, I'm ready to kick some Malachi butt. That's what he said. That's, that's Hebrew, by the way, that's accurate. He said, I, I want to go in, I want my mountain. And there was a determination that caused a declaration. Now, for you to get unstuck, and in just a minute, I want to pray for you. But there's got to be something that rises up in your heart at such a level that you start declaring some things about your future. Just as Caleb did. He said, I will have my inheritance. I'm going in. There is something in each one of us. God will give you a seed of faith. He will give you a vision for your future. He'll give you a hope and a future. But you have to agree with it, be convinced and convicted of it. And if it's in the word of God and in alignment, then you can stand up and begin to declare what God has said over you. And guess what happens? It creates a spiritual reality. See, this is where most people... They just drive the tent stake down so deep in the place of defeat. Because Romans 10, 9, 10, right? How are spiritual realities created? You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. And when you start believing the lies that have been told about you, when you start confessing and, it, and coming into agreement with lies of your enemy, it actually creates a spiritual reality. If you say, hey, I, I'm too old or... You know, I'll probably, probably no one will ever ask me to marry him. I'm 33 now and still single. Or, you know, I'll probably never get back what I had and lost. And we begin to confess those things and it solidifies our real estate. Next thing you know, you are staked down in a desperate and a barren place. But here's how spiritual reality works. And it's not that you have creative power. Listen, this is not just, and I confess the six magic numbers to the lotto. Because most of you have tried that. Oh, I know you. You're on your knees saying, God, give me the Super Bowl number. In Jesus' name, you're anointing the lotto tickets. Yeah, that lady over there. Right? Crickets. Why? Because it's not manipulation and you don't have creative power. But listen, when God speaks over your life and says, I will restore your marriage, your sons and daughters, household salvation, book of Acts, I'm going to bring them back home. When God speaks over you and says, you will be the head and not the tail, Genesis chapter 12, that I'm gonna bless your business so you can be a blessing to all the nations of the earth, right? Corinthians chapter eight and nine where it says, all grace will abound to you so that you can be generous on every occasion and always have some to give away. These are your inheritance, church. And when you get the word of God, I'm telling you, and let me just honor you guys for being here on a Wednesday night in Southern Cal. I mean, look around the room. This is amazing. You're in church on Wednesday night studying the word of God. Don't ever stop. But when you, when you continue to get the word of God in you, it becomes the resource that fuels a confession that will establish your spiritual reality. And when you align your confession with what God has said about you, things start to move in your life. And there's a couple people here today. Listen, listen. Just share this personal story and then we'll call the band up. Uh, recently, we went through a bunch of expansion in our church, and we've been around for 21 years, and it's grown, and it's blessed us, and just in the last few years, man, we started uh, sending out more campuses and raising up pastors, and we just planted a church in San Francisco and one here in Anaheim, and I mean, just so much happening, and there was an attack or there was something I walked through where I, I didn't know if I could accomplish all that God was calling me to do, but I have a practice, and maybe this will help you. 
On my desktop, on my computer, it's a mess. I'm not very organized. Kind of matches my brain. But I have, I have these word docs, and here's what I do. I find out what God has said about me, and I write it down. I take words and thoughts and prayers and I I write them down on these word docs. And when I get into these moments of challenge in my life, I don't trust my emotions. I don't, I'm not moved by what I feel or what I see. I get out the word of the Lord. And I I get in my office and I'll print them out just just so you see what this looks like. I, I print them out and I lay them on the floor and I just sit them around me. And in the middle of the trial, I got no agenda, no appointments waiting. I just take some time and get out what God has said. And most of it's scripture and prayers and thoughts and just prophetic things. And I lay those out before the Lord and I'll start declaring what God has said over my life. Listen, when you do that, there is creative power. There is authority that's released when you declare what God has already said about you. Are you guys getting this tonight? But you gotta have a determination. I'm not gonna be left out in the wilderness. I believe there's a second Jesus movement coming to the West Coast. I will not be left out. I believe God is gonna move by his spirit in Southern California and we're gonna see a revival in thousands and tens of thousands of people coming to Christ. What do you say we're not left out? We have to make some declarations that we are gonna move with God. And the bottom line is this. It's so much bigger than us. Let me just help you for one more minute here. If if you get caught up in your Christian journey where it's just my income, my life, my depression, my anxiety, my my stuff, my stuff, my stuff, you, you you will lose faith, you'll lose momentum. But you gotta step back and realize what God is doing in Cottonwood, what God is doing with thousands of people is so much bigger than what we can see. Let's refresh our memory here. Yeah, the band's coming up. Check this out. This is, uh, again, one more picture of the, the tents in the wilderness. And bring this up, bros. This is what they saw. Now, as awesome as that is, it can get familiar. L- listen, don't ever allow the sacred to become common. I mean, when you see that the first night, you're like, what is going on? There's a God in heaven for sure, and he just landed on earth. But you see it every night and day in and day out. And they would move and there was water from the rock and there was manna and there was quail. Get up, hit repeat, do it all over again year after year until pretty soon. It looks like this is all that's happening. But guess what? Theologians and historians believe that if you could have gone up to Mount Sinai and seen the pattern that they were commanded to camp in and looked at it from a helicopter view or a drone view, bring up this next photo. Here's actually an accurate uh, depiction of the way they camped. And this was God's design. He said, Dan, you're going you're gonna to camp here next to the tent. And Reuben, and uh, I'm always going to want the Levites outside the east gate because they're the worshipers. And what is that? Some 1,500 years before Calvary, God said, I'm bringing my people together on a camping trip. But I'm going to do it in such a way that they're going to be a prophetic picture of a time when Messiah will come and he will bring every tribe and nation. What I'm saying, guys, is they faithfully camped out, but they couldn't even see the end game of what God was doing. And so it is with us. Listen, you keep showing up in the meeting, bro. You keep bringing your tithe. You keep serving. You keep ushering in the back. You keep praying over your city. And we're just camping and moving with the fire. When the fire moves, we move. When the kingdom moves, we move. And we can't see what God is doing. But there is a cross that is being formed in the middle of Southern California where Jesus is being exalted. And if you could lift off the scene, you would look down and say the very image of Christ is being birthed and expanded in Cottonwood Church. So much so that some guy who lives in Northern Cal would come down here and crawl in and sit right in that seat every chance I got because the grace of God. So do not let the fire of God and the holy and the sacred that is your inheritance be commonplace. You're a part of a big deal. God is moving in the earth and he's moving in your church. And I'm saying, what do you say we move with him? In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. I'm gonna ask the band to start making magical, wonderful music. It just makes me sound so much more spiritual. Just a progression of your choice. Ah, feel that? It's like angels. Would you bow your heads? I'm gonna pray for two groups of people. 
just take a moment here and then we're going to wrap up. But let's honor the work of the Holy Spirit in this room. Pray for two groups of people. The first one is you say, Pastor Dave, I'm stuck. I'm a believer. I love God, but I'm stuck. Whether that's marriage, relationship, your walk, your journey with God, your finances, and you've done kind of what you could, but you know you're staked. And tonight, you would just extend your faith and let me agree with you that there would be a moment, even right now, where there's fresh real estate, where, where you can lift up your eyes and say, hey, things are moving forward. I refuse, and here's what I'm asking you to join in prayer with this thought right here. I refuse to stay behind. I'm gonna make a determination in this moment and a declaration that I refuse to stay behind just between you and the Lord, but I wanna agree with you. If you're saying, that's me, Pastor Dave, I'm stuck, I'm ready to get unstuck. Would you just lift up your hand, just wave it, come on, all over the room. People all over the room tonight. It's between you and the Lord, but it's good to let him see that hand raised. You can put those back down. Father, in Jesus' name, now lean in, I just wanna pray over you. In Jesus' name, I'm asking that you would speak a clear word, a moment. God, God kind of works with me like this, but um, I just see some, some housewives in their house right now stopping everything, kneeling down in the kitchen. I see some guys getting up early, laying their Bible out in their bedroom before they go to work. I, I see the Lord calling you to a place of devotion just to hear his whisper. And in that, he's gonna give you some fire. He's gonna give you a word. He's gonna give you something you haven't done, something new, something fresh, but it's gonna get you unstuck. So Father, I pray for my precious brothers and sisters tonight that they would finish the race. And I declare over them right now that he who began a good work in them will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now with your heads bowed, there might be a few people on a Wednesday night that got into this room, but you would say, Pastor Dave, I, I just need to move toward God. I came into this room, I'm seeing these Christ followers, I'm hearing the worship, but I'm not right with God. Lean in. If you're here and you're away from Christ, maybe you've never fully surrendered, or maybe you did years ago and you fell away, but you sense his spirit right now saying, son, it's your time, come home. Daughter, I'm calling you, come home. If that's you and you're ready to say, I don't understand it all, but I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to surrender or recommit my life. I want to agree with you. Would you do something? Just look up at me, make eye contact, and wave at me. Everybody else is just praying, but for you right here, hon, God bless you. The Holy Spirit is all over you right there, right here and next to you and by the sound booth, right here, bro, in the cap behind there, here and here. Folks all about right here on the aisle, man. Thank you. Thanks for waving. That's awesome. That's awesome. People all over. If you're in the risers, thank you, bro, right there. Mm, so good. Hey, so many people lifting their hand. I gotta tell you, God is not angry at you. He's in love with you. He's, he's not coming to judge you. He, he's just excited that you're coming home. You're that one walking back to the house. And he's gonna run to you even now, wrap his arms around you and say, I've been waiting for this moment. And all of heaven rejoices. So I, I'd like us here in the room and if you'd give me the honor to lead you in this prayer. If you're a seeker, if you lifted your hand, if you're just coming to Christ, or if you're a believer, I'd like everybody to repeat after me, and let's make a, a bold declaration with these, making a statement of faith tonight. Repeat this after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, today's my day, and I'm coming home. I thank you for the invitation, and I open my heart to your grace. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and make me your own. And from this day forward, I'll be your disciple till I see you face to face in Jesus name. Come on church, let's just thank the Lord for that, right? Come on, let's celebrate it. Love you guys. Pastor Harrison, love you. Hey, come on, can we thank Pastor Dave one more time? What an encouraging and what a challenging word. Make sure we're moving with the company, moving with the cloud. Make sure we're moving toward that full potential, toward that full capacity, and endeavor not to stay behind. I love it. Our best days are in front of us. God is at work in our midst, and uh, I'm grateful for that word. Thank you guys for being our friends. Thank you for being here. We love you. And uh, hey, for those that are, are new, let me just explain what we're about to do. 
Uh, we're going to transition our, our service now into a time of worship. We like to bookend our services with a time of worship. And worship is where we can respond to what uh, God is doing. We, we like to worship through, through our singing. We're going to do that as well. The team is here. They're going to lead us in one more song this evening. Uh, but we're also going to worship through our giving. And we believe that giving is, is literally sacred before God, that it is an act of worship. Uh, we take a portion of our life, 40 hours a week, some, some more, some less. And we trade that for a, a paycheck. And then we take a portion of that paycheck and we give it into God's kingdom out of obedience and out of a heart of generosity, a, a heart that's been changed by God. Not, not a heart that's trying to manipulate God, but a heart that says, God, everything I have is because of you. And every good gift is from above. And I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And that's why we give. But we literally, we trade that 40 hours of our week, of our life for a paycheck. Then we take a portion of that paycheck. Every time we give, it's literally like we're putting a portion of our life into the offering. And I know people give through the giving containers, the kiosks online, there's so many different ways, but it's important that we all see this as worship, that it's sacred before God. And we realize that together as we give generously, as we give consistently, we're bringing the living Jesus to a dying world. And that's the truth in his world. I don't always say this, but as pastors, it's our great honor and privilege. As a staff, it's our privilege to lead the way in this. We would never stand up here and ask you to think about or pray about participating in something that we don't lead the way in. And every year, my wife and I, we, we endeavor to up our giving goals because we just believe that God is calling us to make a difference in this earth. And we only got one shot. And then we step into eternity. And the only thing that we can take with us are the lives that we've affected for the kingdom of God. And that's what this is all about. We consider it worship. And so we're going to worship a song. The team is going to come now. Jan, by the way, great job leading us tonight. Can we give it up for our amazing worship team? They put in so many long hours and practice time when nobody's here uh, so that they can lead us well. So they're going to lead us in worship. We're going to give. And then I'll hop back up and just give a couple of announcements uh, before we dismiss the service. Come on, Jan, why don't you lead us? There is a song. I know it well, a melody that's never failed on mountains high and valleys low. My soul will rest my confidence in you.
tonight yeah it's been good it's been real good hey listen one quick announcement and I'm gonna pray over us this evening if you lifted a hand tonight and made that decision to make Jesus Lord either for the first time or maybe you're rededicating your life tonight listen uh, you need a couple of things and we want to help you because you didn't just hit the finish line uh, you've just hit the starting gate in this amazing journey with Jesus and we want to help you with your next steps um, if you don't have a Bible we want to give you a Bible. It's our gift to you. And it's great to have a, a Bible program on your smartphone or on your iPad or whatever. But it's another thing to have a, a Bible that you can hold in your hand and write in and, and, and feel the paper between your fingers. We want to give you like a real Bible, one that won't run out of batteries, okay? So, um, and that's our gift to you. It's totally free. And, and then as well, the second thing every Christian needs, we talked about it tonight, is a sense of community. We need each other. The Bible talks about being a body and each part of the body each joint supplies to the growth of the body and, and the truth is I can't be who God's called me to be I can't accomplish what God's called me to accomplish without you and you can't do and be what God's called you to be without me we need each other and if you're not plugged into a local church we'd love to help you whether it's here or somewhere near you live we know a lot of great churches but please please let us help you and the way we can do that is you make your way out tonight right on our plaza it's called the connection spot pastors and leaders are already out there that they're waiting for you just stop and say hey i prayed that prayer we'll put the bible in your hand and we'll, we'll help you with your next steps in following jesus and with that let me pray for us and since we talked about moses and the children of israel and their big camping journey um i thought i'd pray the prayer over us tonight that moses uh, instructed the people or instructed aaron the, the priest to pray over the people and uh, you hear me pray it regularly, but you can find this prayer in Numbers chapter 6. So I want to just pray this blessing over us as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, we love you guys. Thanks for being here tonight. You're dismissed. Hello again, and thank you so much for coming out and joining us for service. We hope that you enjoyed it. And hey, if that was you and maybe you did take that next step and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, first and foremost, we want to welcome you to the family. And then as well, we do have a gift that we want to get into your hands to kind of help on these next couple of steps in your journey, just to help equip you a little bit more. And all you have to do is text the word RESPONSE to 411-247. As well, if you have any prayer requests at all, we would love to link heart with you. And all you have to do is scroll down to any uh, at the bottom of any of our cottonwood.org pages, click on the prayer request link, and submit your prayer request to us. So with that, from our Cottonwood family to yours, wherever you may be tonight, we love you, and we hope that you'll come back and join us this weekend for service. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.